And when we come into this house, and I've been so guilty of it, it's, it's been, you know, what can I get? What can I get? What can I get from this place? Doc is always telling us it's not a, a self-help thing. But when we come in, we're to minister to the Lord. That's who we're here for. That's why we're here. Oh, the beauty of it, that he made the sacrifice. Christ, the lamb that was slain, the blood of God was spilled on our behalf. And that's why we gather. We come to gather in his name. We come to minister to him. So when we are worshiping, that's what we're doing, is we're ministering unto the Lord with our songs, with our praise. It says that we're what? To enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. How many are thankful here tonight? Hallelujah. Well, sit or stand or whatever it is, is the position that you're most comfortable in. But we enter in, Lord, with thanksgiving. We're so thankful. We're so thankful for your goodness. We're so thankful for the breath that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, that we're here today. And we're coming into your courts with praise. And we're so thankful, Lord, that you made the way with Jesus. So let's lift him up and let's worship. Amen. You were the word from the beginning. One with God, the Lord Most High. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without. So, Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name. Of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is. What a powerful 
Amen. I'm better already. Worship, worshiping God will kind of fix you up. So I talked at a funeral today, an old friend, Harvey Howard. Known Harvey since, I don't know, early 90s. He had a dairy, uh, I don't know, about three or four miles that way, west. And we'd go over and get milk and put money in a coffee can. I don't, I don't remember how much it was. But he was never there. He was always off doing something. And I asked my brother when we went the first time, I said, you sure this is okay? He goes, yeah, get what you want. Just put the money in there. And we'd leave a dollar or two extra or something usually. But And so I found out today that there was a lot of people that he knew around the, the neighborhood, I guess, or the, around the region that he gave milk to, went out of his way to give it to them, and he knew they couldn't afford it. But So he and my older brother were pretty close friends, and... Uh, so my brother was feeding our cattle and kind of keeping an eye on them. And um, he got to where he couldn't do that. And so Harvey said, let me do it for a year. Let me do it for a while until you get somebody else. So it was a year or two that he fed for us. And uh, he was a little jumpy. And my oldest daughter figured that out. She was, you know, I don't know how old, eight, seven, something. And she would wait in the barn for him. And he'd come in to get the feed ready. And she'd jump out from behind a hay bale and go, hurry. And he'd jump six feet in the air. He'd say, Hannah, you stop that. And so she didn't. She just found out new ways to do it, kept doing it. He loved it. He talked about it later. He said, yeah. He said he loved that. And he'd come to feed in an old red pickup truck with a mule in the back. No sides, no, no gate, just a mule in the back. And I'd say, Harvey, how'd you get that mule in there? He said, I told her to get in. I said, how do you get her out? He said, I tell her to get out. Oh. So he was a coon hunter. And I think sometimes they'd hunt all night when they were coon hunting. I think sometimes he'd come right from hunting to our place to feed the cattle. And some days he'd come in and be all stove up. He could barely walk. I mean, he's dragging one arm and he's just walking in like that. I said, Harvey, what happened? He said, oh, that old mule threw me. <laughs> yeah? So after about the third time, I said, Harvey, maybe you need a different mule. He goes, no, I love that mule. And it didn't hit me till today that that's how God looks at us. We're an old mule that God loves. And it doesn't matter how many times you throw him off, how many times you turn away, how many times you screw up, how many times you just shake your fist in his face. He's going to hang on to you. Just because he loves you. There's no other reason on earth except for his great love for us. Because of his great love for us, there's grace. There's mercy. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11, it says, uh, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. The word fear there is terror. A lot of people say that word fear means respect. Well, it does mean respect. But it also happens to mean terror. You see... We somehow get the idea that God is kind of like a cosmic Santa Claus. It says, oh, that's okay. Pats us on the head and doesn't care if we sin or doesn't care if we repent. Just, oh, that's okay. No worries. But that's not him. Mm -mm. He's the creator of of the universe. He holds stars in his hands. We are 
not only nothing in his sight, we are smaller than nothing. All the power of the universe rests in him. Oh yeah, you need to be afraid. Because when when he comes onto the scene, well he's on the scene all the time, but even in the old days, the Old Testament, when he'd show up, the ground would shake. He went on Mount Sinai, and the top of the mountain was on fire. Not fire going there, not fire coming out as a volcano, but the thing was on fire. Not a volcano, fire. And the ground shook, and rocks fell off of the mountain. Were they afraid of him? Yeah, you betcha. And his voice thundered so loud that they begged Moses to get him to stop talking. They couldn't stand it. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. You see, Reva said it tonight, Christianity is not a self-improvement club. You don't come here to get your hair cut and your nails done and, you know, work out on the weights a little bit, make you better. Well, you can do that, but it doesn't get you to heaven. There's only one way, and that's to know Jesus and him to know you. And we try to persuade men. Can you say amen to that? Do we? Do we? We need to. That's what we need to be doing. Persuade men that there is a hell coming, that there is a day coming when the chances, the possibilities of turning to God are over. Tim Menzies sings that song about Noah's door. Don't be on the wrong side of Noah's door. God shut the door on the ark. Noah couldn't open it, even if he wanted to. And the people outside drowned. You say, well, that's not a very loving God, is it? Well, number one, you and I don't have the privilege of judging the Word of God. Because the Word of God is true forever and amen. And when we start judging other men or judging the Word of God, we are standing up in God's face and say, I know better. Mm. That didn't work out so well. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade men. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain in your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Ooh. Most of the world takes pride in what is seen. We want a pile of money that people can see. We want a new boat that people can see. We want a big house that people can see. We want a big horse trailer fancy horse. We want all those things so people can see how great we are. Huh? Pride. Mm -mm -mm. Take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. Paul said, I, I don't boast except in the Lord. I don't glory except in the Lord. I glory in Him because only in Him are we alive. We've heard the testimonies tonight, how God did this and God did that. That's just normal stuff. God's got angels around you. God's surrounding you. God is taking care of you. And some of us, he's working harder than others. We need to get off our eyes off of this world. We talked last week, I think, about our eyes on worthless things. Everything in this world that you can see with these eyes, everything's going to burn, going to burn, going to be gone. 
Everything that you can see, every building, every beautiful thing, every tree, everything, every piece of dirt that you know about is going to burn. It's going to be gone. Well, I don't think he can burn all that stuff. Oh, yeah, it'll burn. It'll burn. Since we know how to fear the Lord, we know that it'll burn. And we need to persuade men. Unless you don't care about them. Unless you've written them off. Oh, Harvey didn't ride off his mule. <laughs> kind of wished he would. Couldn't hardly work. <laughs> Verse 13. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. It's for you. If we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. So whether they're crazy or whether they're right-minded, it's for God. It's for us. Verse 14, for Christ's love compels us compels us why did Paul do all the things he did beaten with rods I don't know how many times shipwrecked several times stoned left for dead probably dead got raised from the dead probably beatings whippings prison several times why did he do all that anybody want to sign up for that course Huh? They have some people doing that. They, I can't remember what they call it. They're going to do mission work. Uh, it's called Living Dead or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody heard of it? They're young missionaries. I mean, they just go to Mongolia or China or wherever they're going, and they just live like the people right there. They don't have a house. They don't have anything. They got a robe. <coughs> and they try to witness to people. And I mean, we need to do what God tells us. We don't need to make up stuff. For his love compels us. Compels us. Why do we do it? Because his love compels us. If you're, whatever you're doing, if you're doing it because of God's love, then you're on the right track. If you're doing it because it sounds good, hey, I bet we could do this or do that. I bet we could get more money for the arena. I bet we could get more people in here. I bet we could do this. I bet we could do that. If it's not based on God's love, it's worthless. It's trash. If we're out of our mind, you see, this description of the kingdom describes an upside-down kingdom. And we need to get a hold of that. We need to understand that. We need to walk into that because this is not about us having the American dream. This is not about us having a better life. This is not about us having a bunch of junk that our kids are going to sell the day we die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've got a million books, and I'm pretty sure my daughters are going to have a bonfire in the front yard. Come over if you want to. Bring your hot dogs. It'll be great. Not quite a million. <laughs> in the same little paragraph, we know what it is to fear the Lord, and Christ's love compels us. Because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. We talked about it Sunday a little bit. When Elijah and Elisha, they were in Gilgal. Gilgal was the place after the children of Israel got across the Chile Jordan River, although actually they didn't go through the Chile part. They, they pushed the river out of the way and walked through on dry ground. Just Steve and I have an argument about Jordan River. Anyway. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> and, um, they got across to Gilgal. That was a little village. That was a little town. That's where their headquarters were. They camped there. A lot of things went on there for two or three days or maybe a week or two. And the captain of the army of the Lord visited Joshua. 
Joshua said, are you with us or against us? He said, neither. I'm with the army of the Lord. Whew. You see, Jesus doesn't take sides. <laughs> you can pray for your football team. It's okay. <laughs> All of them. So, I shouldn't tell this story, but I, can I tell a story? So, Lydia, she's not here, she took the baby home, um, was junior rodeo, and we were going almost every weekend somewhere. And uh, so one was close, one was here in Sand Springs, and the youth pastor at the church we went to in Tulsa said, hey, let me know when one's close, I'll come out. So I said, okay. So I called him, he came out, and uh, he got there for the polls, and he said, so this is this her event? Yeah. This is her age group? Yeah. How many girls in it? I said, I think 12. He said, okay. Which one is she? Uh, 12, I think. Okay, all right, I'm ready. I'm thinking, you're ready? What are you talking about? So the first girl gets out there, and he says out loud, Lord, let her knock down a pole. <laughs> and I'm kind of moving away from him, you know? It's like, I got friends here. She knocked pole down. He said, Lord, the next one, slow her horse up. And the horse jumped and jiggled around and went that way. All 12 of them screwed up their run. All Lydia had to do was do a good path. She did, and she won. And he walked out of there, and we were both with our mouths hanging open like, can you do that? <laughs> you see, the prayer was for Lydia, not for winning or losing. Jesus cares about you. And whether he causes you to win something someday to encourage you or whether he lets you fall flat on your face so he can encourage you and build you up he'll do that for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all Jesus and therefore all died see he died for all Gilgal the other thing that God did is he came and he said I have removed the reproach of Israel the reproach of Egypt from you. <coughs> it's gone. And see, we stand right now, the whole world stands right now, having sins paid for. The sins of the human way, race are paid for. Everybody's. Well, what about that guy in China that's killing those people? What about this? What about those guys with the green scarves? That's a pretty green. It's too bad they stole it. Does God love them? Yeah, he does. And I bet some of them got saved through this. I'll bet you. And, uh, you see, in a sense, God said, because of Jesus, all have died. It wasn't Noah's time when they all did drown. This time Jesus died, and therefore all died. Therefore all died. Therefore everyone has died. But the difference, the separation point, is whether or not you take Jesus at his word and receive him as Lord and accept the forgiveness that he's paid for. Because if you do and invite him in, he'll change you. You'll be born again. I was going to say, you guys are kind of kind of asleep or something. I'm the one that's supposed to be asleep. <laughs> There's water up here, too. Look at that. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So the ones who are now alive, that's us, born again, born again out of the dead. See, we were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were dead. I keep falling out of here. Something I said, I guess. <laughs> I'm not going to bend over because I might land on my nose and y'all laugh. Janine would, I know. <laughs> I didn't hear that, but I'm sure it was good. 
And he died for all. That those who live, that's us. John 11, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. We're alive. We're alive. We weren't alive before. But when you're born again, now you're alive. Now you live for him. Now you live for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. No one. No one. You're either dead or you're alive. Huh? Are you with me? Though we once regarded Christ in that way, a worldly point of view, we do so no longer. Oh, it's not wrong to talk about and think about Jesus of Galilee and the Jesus boots and the long hair. And I mean, we love Jesus. But he's not that guy anymore. He's the risen Lord. He's got eyes like wool, hair like wool and eyes like fire and his voice like thunder. Those Israelites trembled at his voice. He was there. He was on Mount Sinai. But we don't regard Christ this way any longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. <coughs> That's a real important word, creation. He created Adam and Eve. And then they populated the earth. When we're born again, we're a new creation. We're a new species, is what that word means. It's a new species. You're not a frog anymore. You're a toad. <laughs> You're not a salamander anymore. You're a newt. You didn't know I knew all those words, did you? We're different. We're so different that we're not even a human being anymore. There's three kinds of people on the earth right now. Jews because they have a covenant with Abraham. And people who are non-Jew and people who belong to Jesus. That's the third group. We're a new species of people. We're a new order of people. We're a new <coughs> group. We're born again. We're born again and we're not ever going to die. We'll shrug our body off someday. And, boy, I never miss an opportunity to at a funeral to swing for the fences telling them how to get saved because you know there's nothing like a dead body for an object lesson there you go he's a new species the old has gone and the new has come see when you become alive in Jesus your past is gone. That old man is gone. God doesn't look at it, doesn't keep track of it. It's gone. All things are made new. And those guys I talked to, a couple of old fellas that <clears throat> were in Vietnam and asked me, told me some of the stuff they did and their attitudes, and he said, would God forgive that? And I go, yeah, he already has. Yeah. He already has. Well, what about this? I said, yeah, that too. He said, I'm not going to tell you the rest. I said, thanks. I don't want to hear it. Can God forgive anybody of anything? Yeah. Yeah. His grace and his forgiveness is bigger than anything. How about people that keep doing the same stupid thing over and over and over and over like Harvey's mule? them too the new has come you can't go back to the past 
even if you wanted to. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. So God, who is a pillar of fire, reconciled us to himself. We were an enemy of God. Romans, it says, while we were enemies of Christ, he died for us. We were enemies. We were not on his side. We were on the other side. We were dead. And we were going to be in hell forever because we're dead, and that's where dead go. But we're alive now. We're alive in Christ Jesus. New creature. This is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ because of what Jesus did on the cross. He paid all the debt of sin for everyone that ever walked on the planet and ever will walk on the planet. He took my sin onto himself and became guilty with my sin. He became my sin and God gave him the full amount of wrath do me and do you and everybody else. The crucifixion was bad enough Nails and th crown of thorns and beatings. That was the easy part. The tough part was the spiritual death. That was the physical death. But he died spiritually and went to hell because he took the death of a sinner. He took the death of a dead one. Since we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try, we try to persuade men. The ministry of reconciliation because of Christ. Verse 19, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. What in the world does that mean? Is it up there? There you go, right there. You can turn around and see it right there. Oh, I know you got it here. I still can't see that clock. There's a clock on mine. Do you see it? That's wishful thinking on Jim's part. <coughs> Not counting men's sins against them. They're paid for. Why isn't he counting them? Because they're paid for. Not counting men's sins against them. What do you mean? Most people think God goes around with a tablet or an iPad or something, and he's writing your name down every time you do something wrong. He's taking notes. He's, you know, Santa Claus makes a list, checking it twice. God doesn't do that. God doesn't make a list. He doesn't have to check it twice. He knows. He's there. <laughs> Not counting men's sins against them. But you know what? If we don't receive forgiveness for those sins that he's paid for, we're still dead. You've got to receive it. You've got to have an interaction with God Almighty. You've got to have a commitment in your heart to him and him to you. It's called a covenant. That's what we get when we come to God. We get a covenant. A covenant in the Old Testament was quite a thing. Abraham made a covenant with another king around there. And what it meant was, if I'm in trouble, you come help me. If you're in trouble, I come help you. They would trade articles of clothing, maybe a shirt or a something, vest, I don't know, whatever they traded, and weapons. They might trade knives or something. And then they would have something bleed, maybe themselves. That was one way. They'd cut each other. Like the old movies, the old Blood Brothers. They did some of that. But mainly they would bring two perfect calves and two perfect lambs and two perfect goats and kill them and cut them in half and they would walk between them and say, this is what happens to the one who breaks this covenant. And it also means that Everything I have is yours. And everything you have is mine. 
we have a covenant with God Almighty. Everything he has is ours because we've given him everything we have. Haven't we? Got kind of quiet there. You can't hold on to it. You can try, but you can't hold on to it. It's just wishful thinking. You think you can hold on to this stuff. He gave it to you. He gave you the ability to gain wealth. He gave you the, the skill and the ability to use your hands and your head to do stuff. He gave you what you have. People say, I worked on my own two feet for all that. I earned all that. That's all mine. No, 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 you're mistaken. That's the devil talk there. Because if he didn't open doors every day, if he didn't give you grace to get out of bed every day, if he didn't find food for you to eat, if he didn't find a car for you to drive, if he didn't guide you on the road in there, you'd have never made it. I love that song, I can't even walk without him holding my hand. And that's true. If you ever think you're getting big enough to tell God, hey, I think I got it now, you know, you can back off. I've kind of got, got it figured out here. I can do all this. Mm -mm. You're heading. You're aching for a breaking. You're cruising for a bruising. Because you're going to hit the wall. Because you can't do it without him. Not counting men's sins against them because they're paid for. But if you don't have them under the blood, if you've not received them, if you've not committed yourself to him and come into the family as a child of the Most High God, and that's an act. You have to do that. It's not just thinking those words in your head. You have to do that. You have to know that you've made a commitment to God. It's harder for old people. Not that I know any. But little kids do it. You say, well, they're too young to understand. No, they're not. Six-year-old, five-year-old, you tell them Jesus loves them, their eyes open up. Would you like to ask him into your heart? Yeah. Because it's not your words. It's the Holy Spirit of God hovering over that child, loving him and empowering him to understand. And when he says yes, whoo, they're dancing in heaven. Because that child is going to grow up belonging to the king. He doesn't have to go to the bars. He doesn't have to go to jail. He may yet, but he doesn't have to. He's got, he got a leg up on all this deal. Proverbs says something about that. Turn to God early so you don't have to go through a bunch of junk. That's my version of it. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God's behalf, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You have to come to him. You have to lay it down. And you'll make that covenant. You'll get born again. And then the 21st verse it says, God who made him, Jesus, who had no sin, Jesus who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Since we know what it is to fear God, we need to live in the righteousness of God of God. When you're dead, you can't do it. Before you come to Jesus, you can't live a righteous life. You can't do it. You might try. Some, some gangsters and bandits decide to build an orphanage or a hospital or something in a big city, and they do something good occasionally. But for the most part, they're bad because they're still the old man is in charge. But when you come to Jesus, the old man's put to death and you get a new man in there, born again. And now you're prone to righteousness. You might sin on occasion, but you are prone to righteousness because of this. 
He assigns that righteousness to us. He declares us to be righteous. Do we have to cooperate? Yeah, we have to cooperate. We have to say yes. But if you will, and if you'll stay connected to the vine and your eyes on Jesus, he'll take you right through. Show you great adventure, great exploits, not only in this world, but in all the worlds to come. Father, I thank you that your word is true. That your word is true. And nothing else that we hear from the world or other men is necessarily true. Sometimes it might get lucky and be true, but your word is true, always true. And we thank you that we can stand on it, that we can depend on it, that we can give you our lives and you'll take care of us and take us to heaven. Father, I thank you that as we open our hearts to you and ask you to come in, that you do that right now. Lord Jesus, we ask you to be Lord of our life. We ask again, some for the first time maybe, <coughs> we submit to you because I've made a mess of my life. So I give you my life to straighten out. And I thank you that your love and your presence is mine. If you want us to pray with you, we'd love to sit with you and talk and pray. And You can do it yourself. You don't need anybody else. You just ask him. But you ask him to come in. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him for what you need. If you need healing or deliverance, ask him. He wants to help you. He wants to save you. He wants to set you free. Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for your blessing. And I claim the blood of Jesus over all of us. God bless you all. Thank you for coming.